So we're going to be uh, sharing with you um, research insights, right? That uh, that we've been recently working on. So I'll be first uh, talking about um, the performance score in Financial Times series for uh, around 30 minutes, and then uh, we will have another uh, faculty member, the Matthew Dixon, who's who's going to talk us about um, deep learning and finance, right? So he has uh, uh, really wonderful stuff to show uh, today. So without further ado, um, I'm going to start um, uh, my presentation. Uh, please flee to, feel free to uh, some sort of uh, ask questions uh, along the way. So maybe the best thing is you also can unmute, right? And, and, and ask the question, right? Uh, because, uh, or uh, alternatively, I will look at the chat when, when I finish uh, my talk, right? Okay, so, um, so today I'm, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, one issue um, that we think it's central uh, in, um, in finance, which is the financial time series, right? And what is the performance curve of financial time series? So we're gonna investigate uh, so how the performance curve uh, using uh, largely dimensional models, right? Can, uh, so what is the performance curve of uh, the training error, the test error, and, 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 and if, the, if that it fits the, the, the traditional view, right, uh, of, uh, of uh, the U-shape or double descent. So we're gonna discuss that. Uh, first of all, for the ones who do not know our, our, uh, uh, our organization, so we're an institute, our mission is to, to be the world leading educator. Uh, and we offer uh, one of the most comprehensive and in-depth educational programs and uh, is taught by a diverse staff, world leading academics and practitioners, right? So you can visit uh, our re website and, and, and have a look to, to our fantastic team. Um, just before digging into, uh, into the research, just to say that we're offering a, a, a summer bootcamp uh, from August 23rd to September 3rd, 2021. So just a few uh, weeks away. It's a 40 hours um, uh, <clears throat> boot camp with lecturers, uh, practice and speakers, uh, a lot of uh, maths, a lot of code, a lot of practice and uh, the evaluation we give where you can, guys can pass and get a certificate. Uh, the evaluation is an exam and a project certificate and a project and then you can have the certificate and uh, the audience is the quantitative analysts, computer scientists, risk managers, traders, investment managers, data scientists, and uh, okay, and it's 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 needed for the bootcamp uh, some sort of basic finance, and obviously maths and uh, uh, Python. We do, we do a lot of Python, uh, TensorFlow, Scikit, uh, and PyTorch too. Okay, so let's discuss. Uh, the general problem we will try to answer. Well, I'll try to answer uh, in these 30 minutes, um, in these 30 minutes, so what is uh, the, the shape of the performance score, which we, th we think it's a central uh, problem in finance. And um, before that, le let, me, let me give you some sort of a, a little bit of a background of what are, what are the latest, some sort of the, the empirical and theoretical discoveries in regards to generalization properties of highly dimensional models over parameterized models um, that we see in the recent uh, literature, right? Not exclusively finance, but broadly speaking, uh, machine learning uh, and AI community. So uh, maybe the best start is just to say that uh, well, we often see in the literature uh, some sort of lots of inductive biases uh, in terms of recommendations that we need to follow in our models in regards to model selection, in regards to the architecture, in regards of the algorithms, in regards of the uh, optimization algorithms. And oftentimes, uh, you know, we put all the problems uh, into the same bucket, 
right? And I think it's always a good introduction to say, well, things are very different depending on the environment we're trying to model, right? So again, I'm talking about a time series, which is uh, some sort of, uh, a, a, a sort of an environment which is partially observable, in which we have multiple agents, in which is stochastic, a little bit deterministic, but mostly stochastic, is uh, sequential instead of episodic, is dynamic, uh, and, it's the, and, and it's a discrete um, modeling setting. But we oftentimes, uh, for example, when we do options, we, we, we move on to a continuous uh, setting. Right, um, so we will see that 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 makes uh, that has a huge impact in terms of the tools, right? That we that we have to use when encountering so things like um, a stock, a lot, some sort of stochastic a stochastic uh, modeling environment instead of deterministic. So, for example, right, there's a domain in which uh, artificial intelligence is, is making good progress and 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 efficiency. And, and it's very high, which is image analysis, analysis which is a, a much, some sort of simple, right? Uh, compared to, uh, for example, financial markets or, or language, right? Which is also partially observable. We have multiple agents, stochastic, sequential, dynamic, and discrete. So uh, other environments like um, um, <clears throat> image uh, are, fully observable, we have single agents, it's, it's mostly deterministic, right? It's episodic, it's semi-static semi and uh, in a continuous time setting. Well, anyway, that, that's important because uh, our conclusions, or, or at least on the theory side, is that, is that the performance, the generalization, the inductive biases that we need to use in our model can be really very different, right? So in some environments, maybe we should use very simple models, right? In other environments, right, uh, maybe we should use overparameterized models, like some of these uh, domains in which we, we should be using overparameterized models. Um, I'm not gonna talk in detail about that, but obviously well, this is just a definition of machine learning and finance, right? And um, we're going to define the problem in the sense that we're going to be um, predicting a time series. So we, 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 we're doing supervised learning regression where we go from Rn to, uh, to R. And um, the way we, we try to uh, train the algorithms is we pick a training set and then we test them uh, in the test set. And obviously, you know, the uh, empirical risk minimization is that, right, we should be uh, our, uh, our, our goal is to minimize the test set error, right? And, and, and uh, when the, the way we look, we do that is we train the algorithms in the training set. So uh, training set performance and test set performance is obviously uh, what the, what the uh, uh, modelers are, are focusing on. Okay. Um, we have lots of algorithms to choose. Right, and this uh, in terms of doing regressions, we can do linear regression. We can do non-linear regression. Right, uh, we can do ensemble methods uh, like XGBoost and random forest. We will show uh, actually uh, some of work here. Decision trees and neural networks. So all, all of these guys are non-linear. I can deal uh, with high-dimensional spaces. So the main idea or the main is is um, well, how can we use these models, right? How can you use these deep architectures? So there, there are several papers that claim, right, that uh, you can have a state of the art uh, results in fact on models times series of classification. This is indeed true, right? The fact that you, that some of these deep architectures, for example, uh, GRUs or LSTMs or NBEATs, right? So time series. Um, kind of architectures can deliver, right? Uh, at least good, uh, as lead, at least as good results as we can achieve uh, by using in using benchmark models, like for example, Armagarge or Barmagarge uh, or uh, some sort of the benchmark econometric models. Um, we can also use uh, these overparameterized or, or deep architectures in using deep, deep reinforcement learning, and we have. A, a competing model, which is XGBoost. That's why when we investigate 
the, the performance score uh, we will be using, uh, we will be using also trees uh, and ensembles, which, which work very well also in the financial time series domain. What are the, on the other side, what are the problems, right? So problems, um, as we all know, some financial markets, uh, right, might be uh, non stationarity So we might encounter so different probability distributions or different environments in the future than the ones that we saw in the in the training set. So this is obviously something that is going to impact generalization. I'm going to be talking about generalization uh, for the rest of my talk, right? Obviously, non non stationarity is a serious problem for generalization, right? Because if our algorithms have been trained in a data set. Uh, the par parameters have been learning in this data set, right? Um, then what they're encountering in real life is this: is the training set or the real life uh, problem be close to the training set? So, uh, so this is obviously um, uh, 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 an issue in the performance. Interpretability is obviously an issue. The more highly dimensional nonlinear model, the higher it's going to be to interpret. And this is obviously something that we're going to need to put uh, in our model risk. And then we're going to try to, to, um, to answer two questions. One, one main question is uh, about overfitting. Can, can we say, what can we say about overfitting when using overparameterized models uh, in real time series, in real financial time series? Okay, so here I have a few slides that are basically covering some theoretical aspects. So here I'm gonna go quickly through them, but uh, well, the classic theorems is minimum description length. So we should co be compressing the data. Uh, we should be uh, basically uh, following the receipts of Kolmogorov complexity and obviously Occam Razor, which is the, in principle, we have to favor models that correspond to shortest programs based on Kolmogorov complexity. So we all learned that the simpler the model, right, in principle, probably is going to be able to generalize better. So this was, uh, and this is, uh, for some domains, uh, really the way to go. But we will see that even on that domain, we can just say that um, because of parameterized models, actually, uh, oftentimes, some sort of somehow violate uh, these. Okay, why, why this uh, some sort of deep learning non-parametric or, or, or these ma machine learning non-parametric models uh, are working so well? We all know there's, there's, there's a few universal approximation theorems. So we all know that, that it can, they can approximate very well, um, right? Um, with just a few uh, output layers and, and activation functions, we can approximate anything pretty much. Right, and then we know that they also operate well or relatively well with stochastic processes. But a lot of uh, a lot of more research is needed here. Right? Uh, okay. What else? Okay. Then about mother risk curve for deep learning. So this idea of regularization and, and, and generalization error. So there's the, one of the inductive inductive biases model is used is. Uh, regularization. So the fact that it's a common way to control overfitting, right? Uh, uh, okay. And that that's the case for some data sets. Some data sets really uh, some sort of improve uh, when you do regularization. But uh, in some others, we see that we don't need explicit regularization or that basically Regularization is not is neither necessary nor sufficient for reducing generalization error, right? So the sources of error, right? Um, it uh, so we will see that that we think or I think that in finance the sources of error are not necessarily the dimensionality of the model, but it's more uh, it, it it's more about the intrinsic randomness of the of the of the of the environment or. Um, obviously, um, the, the, the estimation of the parameters, right? And the potential non-stationarity. Dimensionality is another thing that uh, some sort of is uh, uh, researched and there's a recent research on that. So let me... <clears throat> okay, maybe just one word on optimization without moving on. Uh, so we thought, so 
Deep learning and optimization. Well, so the question here is why stochastic gradient descent works so well, right? Uh, with deep neural networks, they're just uh, for the ones interested. So there are recent uh, papers that are, right, some sort of um, saying, yes, well, we, we cannot, in this over parameterized neural networks, we cannot uh, even convexity, it's not, uh, so convexity doesn't even hold locally, right? But then there's, uh, uh, for a broad range of optimization problems, this Poliak and Lohsiavich uh, right, theorem that, um, that it's, it, it applies here, right? So we now have some proof that uh, yet the yes, stochastic the gradient descent in some environments is really uh, because um, the PNL condition, so Poliak and Lohsiavich, it's actually holding, right? And this uh, provides us guarantees right, on the convergence of the gradient descent. Okay, the, the bias variance trade-offs, I'm, sure, I'm sure you guys know what we're talking about. So the, this, uh, so um, when, when we look at the decomposition of the error square, uh, y0 plus f hat x0, right, what captures the model is the variance of f hat x0 plus the bias square, right? And uh, basically our model, uh, we choose models that reduce uh, by variance and bias, right? And uh, we have the variance of epsilon, which is sometimes uh, some sort of um, in the machine learning literature that operates in probably more deterministic uh, settings, right? Is, is sometimes even disregarded. But in our case, variance of epsilon and intrinsic randomness is gonna be important. This is gonna act as a limit to our predictive power. Okay, so basically what motivate or part of what motivates uh, the, the research, this, re this research was investigating this very puzzling finding that we all, tr we all learned that basically, right, well, the, the, the performance curves so will have the capacity of the model on one side and we have uh, the error on the other side. And we said, okay, there's a sweet spot in, in between underfitting and overfitting, if we increase the capacity of our model, our model is gonna start overfitting, right? So, um, and then the test risk is gonna be much higher than the training risk. And the training risk can eventually even go to very low levels, okay? And we had to find the sweet spot between underfitting and overfitting. So just the right number of parameters uh, so as to we find ourselves uh, here in the U. Right, but um, you know, Belkin uh, it, and collaborators uh, right, wrote a paper a couple of years ago called "Reconciling Machine Learning Risk," and and uh, and they investigated um, that, and they found that for some data sets, right, they under actually if you overparameterize the model regime, uh, so you basically enter in an interpolating regime, and actually you can re reduce further the Test risk, which is actually your uh, primary goal, right, by increasing the, the number of parameters, right? Um, okay. So the question we will try to answer is how is this uh, performance curve um, in, uh, in finals, okay, in time series? Okay, just a few words on, um, on inductive biases. So, so, excuse me, on, on empirical findings. So we can find uh, in other domains that are not time series finance, tra zero training error on random labels, the lack of explicit uh, regularization, the dependence of initialization, interpolation of noisy trading data, and um, the fact that further over-parameterization uh, over in some environments improve generalization performance. All these basically suggest Right, that the generalization performance is a non-trivial interplay of the data distribution, PZ, the real distribution, so the one we're gonna find in the future, and combined with the properties of our learning algorithm, right? And remember, our learning algorithm, it has parameters too, it has uh, optimization, uh, optimization uh, procedures, and so on and so forth. So what's, what that suggests is that it's very hard to have some sort of inductive biases, so things that help us choose models that we can some sort of generalize. So that's why we have to have these domain-specific 
uh, knowledge, um, probably, for example, using uh, more, more standard econometric models and try to some sort of uh, merge, right, um, with um, some of the new um, uh, architectures. Okay. Well, some of the inductive biases, so inductive biases, right, uh, is the use of um, uh, prior knowledge um, about the world in order to efficiently learn new, con new concepts, right? So, uh, so how can we choose, um, so how can we, ch what are the properties, right, that our models, that our data or our models has to meet in order to have good uh, gener generalization performance? And we oftentimes use things like uh, maximum conditional independence, minimum cross-validation error, maximum margin, minimum description length, uh, and, and, and things like nearest neighbors, right? You will find all this in the paper, which is still, uh, will, that will be in SSRN very soon, okay? Other inductive biases are, right, uh, yeah, probably the well-known, the most well-known are these on, on deep learning inductive biases. So, uh, for example, a fully connected neural network, um, right, um, has a Entities are units, relations all to all, related inductive biases weak, convolutional that are used in images uh, are good for sp spatial translation and so on. And recurrent, which is typically what it's being used for sequential time steps um, uh, and the invariance they, 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 they try to learn is time translation, right? And recurrent neural networks is, are typically being used uh, on some of the uh, uh, recent research on um, time series, right? Uh, uh, again, long short term memory networks or vanilla uh, multi layer perceptrons or N bits, uh, which is what we used in, in another uh, paper. And also we have graph networks and the invariances, uh, right? These nodes, edge permutations. So this helps us to so have data in which we think the data set has this, uh, we're looking for these invariance properties. Right, uh, we need to be using uh, these architectures. Okay, so now um, let's investigate um, what can we say about the performance curve in financial time series. So, is it a U shape? Is this a double descent? Is this something else? Right. So, um, okay, yeah. Well, here we have a slide about generalization error, but not going to go into that. Maybe. Let's focus on the experiment. So um, we use, um, we use uh, time series, this time series, three indices, S&P 500, FUSI 100, MSCI Emerging Market Index. We use daily edge LC data for the experiment for the first Jan 2010, January 2019. And we, we just use the 5% of the data, right? Um, um, in order to train excuse me, as a test set, okay? Okay, what do we see uh, in this? Um, in, so here we see uh, on one side, uh, so, so here we have an, an LSTM, right? Which is long short term memory networks, recurrent neural networks, right? So what can, what can we see? So we, uh, the number of epochs, which is also uh, another way, um, some sort of to investigate uh, the complexity of the model, or, or at least the non regularization of the model, and then MSC uh, mean square error uh, training. And what we see, right, is that, is that um, basically um, LSTMs, for example, can, can pretty much uh, some sort of, if, we, if you, do, you use in our parameters and our layers and our neurons, uh, basically memorize the data set, so get, so the MSC uh, train gets to real, really, really low, right? And then EMSC test, so the mean square in the test set just stabilizes, okay? Okay, so what does that mean, right? That, be, that means two things. One, with, that fits very well with what, with what uh, practitioners have seen, right? Uh, and have been experienced is, is uh, some models can actually provide with a very good uh, right, some sort of training error uh, in spite of the si of the noise to signal ratio, right? So the back testing that you can show is really impressive. But on the other side, 
right? What we see is there is a clear limit on the predictability of, um, of this specific algorithm in this specific data set, which is uh, just flat, right? So increase dimensionality, you reduce, um, you reduce to a very, very low training error, right? But the test error, you cannot improve it further. So it's neither a U-shape nor a, a double descent, right? So uh, if we use random forest, right, um, for time series, we see something uh, similar, right? So we, we have a one side training MSC and the test MSC, and then the number of estimators. And we see a similar thing. So there's a limit on the predictability, right? That a random forest can achieve in this, uh, using our training set, uh, using our data set, excuse me. And then what we see is the MSC of the test set, you cannot improve it further, right? By increasing dimensionality, it's just stable. So they, so we would, another way to say that is that, uh, you know, overfeeding, so to speak, remains constant because um, again, you memorize the data set, uh, but even memorizing the data set, so the expectation of epsilon, so to speak, right? Uh, just hits as a, as a, as a prediction uh, limit, so to speak. The same thing happens, right? Uh, the same thing a little bit happens with, uh, excuse me, this is, um, yeah, this is, a, this is neural networks and this is XGBoost. So with XGBoost, it happens the same thing. It starts, it actually goes in sync. The MSC training and the MSC test, okay? So uh, the MSC training can be very low, right? Uh, and, um, and, and here you will also see that um, XGBoost operates very well on the MSC test. Okay, so let me uh, conclude a, a bit uh, this very quick uh, uh, research talk, right? So um, again, motivated by, um, by some of the machine learning papers that investigate uh, the performance curve, uh, we wanna investigate if the dimensionality of uh, time series models uh, using SGBoost or using uh, random forest or using LSTMs or vanilla uh, neural network really impact overfitting, right? So do we have a U-shape, right? Or, and the, the answer clearly, we look at the data is now we don't see a U-shape. We don't, we don't also see something that, again, Belkin et al. Uh, some sort of found a couple of years ago on the double descent shape is that you over parameterize the model and yes, Right, the test set, the test performance improves further, right? So we don't see that, okay? So it has a flat, flat, prof a flat profile. Or at, some, at, at, at some moment you cannot improve, right? Uh, you, you, you maybe uh, achieve your best training error feat that you can find, but the test, uh, the test um, uh, error remains high, okay? So, and well, another finding that it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, obviously practitioners know very well is that the, if you increase dimensionality, you, of, you overstate, right? You will tend to overstate, right? The performance um, of your model because on the training set, you can achieve uh, obviously very high, right? Uh, or very low MSE, okay? Uh, so the paper is not yet on, on SSRN. You can also find uh, some of our other papers in which we investigate deep learning uh, for equity time series prediction, right? Uh, deep learning uh, for asset allocation in US equities, a, a, a paper in which we investigate a similar thing, uh, which is can we use meta learning approaches to model uncertainty in financial time series, right? Another way, to some sort of try to improve generalization performance is to use meta-learning um, approaches that uh, instead of uh, investigating and uh, investigating only the data set you, you have, right, uh, also investigate our data sets. And we, we actually try here NBITS, uh, which is a, a meta-learning time series model that works very well Okay, so I really encourage you to read uh, that paper. And we also uh, wrote 
uh, last year I wrote some papers on uh, alpha ESG and SDG. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, the model, but, but the model is trying to predict um, uh, the return uh, on, on T plus one. So it's a very simple, right? Um, okay, it's very simple. So you try to predict um, uh, next day performance return, right? Linear returns, okay? And uh, Yeah, well, Jax is, is asking about the random minimization for neural networks leads to different equity curves, right? Um, yeah, as usual, as, as that's, that's obviously a very good question. So you have to investigate to what extent uh, where you start uh, some sort of infuses such a strong prior, right? That then mm, it, lead, it really leads to a very different equity curves, right? I think this is another problem. You should investigate thoroughly in your data set, right? If, if that's the case, right? So you need to run, right? Um, you know, several initialization and do look at the neural networks or, you know, your, your machine learning model and, and, and investigate that. Okay. Okay, good. That was fast. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so now we have with us um, um, Matthew Dixon, right? Uh, Matthew, that uh, can start sharing his slides. Okay. Yeah, welcome Matthew Dixon, right, uh, to this webinar. He's gonna show us very interesting new stuff, right? And uh, I think Matthew uh, doesn't need an introduction, but he's one of the uh, uh, best researchers and practitioners in the space, right? Uh, right, he's works at the in Illinois Institute of Technology, He's a faculty member, and he has a brilliant piece of research uh, about uh, financial modeling with deep learning. Hey, well, thanks, Miguel, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to, to tie some of the ideas here to some of the concepts that uh, Miguel has already mentioned. Um, and uh, before we, we go any further, I think it's, you know, I think everyone would agree that uh, this, this view that that does exist uh, in in the industry that you know there's really little hope for, for deep learning and and it's sort of the uh, you know the end of the road and there is a lot of skepticism in the industry um, and some have questioned why deep learning hasn't been as sort of um, as transformative uh, as it's been in some other application areas image processing speech recognition and so on um, but I think we're, we're still getting there um, you know there isn't nearly as much funding going into uh, machine learning specifically for finance, as there is at you know Google and FaceLab and and uh, NSF type funding. So I think we're we're getting there, uh, and of course we don't really know what goes behind closed doors at the major institutions. Uh, so that being said, you know we've seen in the M4 contest and the M5 contest examples of uh, time series based uh, deep learning performing extremely well, um, winning those competitions. And so there's uh, indeed a great deal of of hope. On the other hand. Um, as Miguel has already touched on, there are a number of rather unique or, or certainly um, <clears throat> shared properties with, with other application areas. Uh, one of them being, of course, the low signal to noise ratio um, that's sort of inherent in the nature of the financial market, trading, um, sort of irrational behavior and so on. Uh, then there's the questions of uh, economic interpretability. Um, you know, it's not enough just to, to have uh, sort of trained parameters, we really like to understand. Um, and, um, and, and if, if we will go even as far as explainability, uh, my personal view is that we want auditability uh, at the very minimum. We want to be able to audit those models. Um, explainability might be asking a little bit too much, but we should aim high. And then of course, there is a, a general sort of 
uh, sort of attitude that you just plug and chug and, and you get brute force, um, you know, power up the GPUs, the cloud computing resources, uh, and off you go. And, uh, and we know that sort of in general, that sort of brute force approach didn't really work before in, in the sort of history of algorithms, genetic algorithms and so on. And it's questionable whether that will work at all. Um, and in fact, it doesn't work very well. Um, and I'm gonna show you some problems where you really need to think about it um, and actually incorporate uh, the principles in the financial markets or some uh, model. It, 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 this is in the spirit, in a sense of inductive bias, but it's going a little bit further and actually building, tailoring uh, those architectures for finance, as opposed to taking a TensorFlow, LSTM, or taking any deep learning tool and just using it. How can we modify the tool by going, in, in the sense I'm going in and I'm modifying the back end of TensorFlow and come up with something that's a little bit more tailored for finance? Now that might seem to, to some uh, slightly uh, unnatural, but of course, that's what scientists do. We open up the box um, and we, we, we modify it. Um, and then we give it to engineers and the engineers use those boxes. And so we're going to look at examples where there really are several sort of problems. Um, and, and so let's, uh, let's see here. Next uh, slide here. I seem to have lost my slides. So show that again. Shut down my slides and open it again. Hope that, that fixes it. Yes, okay, great. Apologies for that. Um, so let's look at the motivation for model based deep learning, where we try to incorporate some knowledge of the financial markets model directly into the deep learning architecture. Um, or in the objective function. I say or because in some cases it may be better to do that rather than to modify the architecture itself. And so what we want to do is we want to incorporate modeling constraints into the learning process. For example, preserving no arbitrage prices, um, which are, is very important in finance, or we want to be able to um, fill in some gaps in data coverage. One of the biggest misnomers because you have not a non-stationarity in finance is that if you somehow train on some, some historical data, you'll be just fine in the future. And of course, if the data is always changing, how can you know that your historical data is representative of your future? Moreover, you may only observe certain variables, input variables, features in certain states. And what if those change in the future in, in ways that have never been seen before in your historical data? Is the architecture really, is the deep learning model going to really handle that situation correctly? So there's quite a bit of a focus now on simulating data and trying to simulate all the different permutations, which combinations of the data in, in an effort to ensure that you have data that's future-proof and not just fitted to, to the past. It may not even be overfitted. You may have may perform just fine on, on your historical data sets, but the moment that you apply it to something that's new, um, you, you can even, you know, it may, it may well, it may, it may seem to generalize well for some time and then all of a sudden it no longer works. So we may need additional models to solve that problem. That's one approach. It's not the only approach. Uh, and we also may need better algorithms than we currently have, um, rather than just standard off the shelf algorithms. Um, I'll focus primarily on regression here problems, but everything in this talk is also geared towards classification. So we're gonna present the following framework. We're gonna present two different types of frameworks, one for IID data, so cross-sectional data, and one for time series data. Um, and I'll give two examples, both one with IID data and one with time series data. Now, in our modeling setup, remember our goal here as practitioners is to model some financial problem and infer, and infer uh, some uh, map between some space x and some output space y, input space x, output space y, x is your space of features, y is your, are your labels. Um, and there may additionally be 
some nonlinear partial differential operator that's necessary to impose on F itself in order to incorporate some financial model that can help uh, with, with guide the neural network towards some more sensible results. And the reason for doing this is that you do not have this idealized pool of data. We can see that in an example. You often have messy data, it's noisy, and the coverage is poor. And you really need to incorporate another financial model, like a partial differential equation, like a Black-Scholes equation, for example, into the model itself in order to Im improve it. And I'm not suggesting that this is the only approach. And of course, this is controversial. That's the nature of research. Um, and the main idea as well is that instead of just using per perceptual layers, we're going to replace them with any model we like. Weighted parameterized models that can perform some set of property that have certain properties that we would like. And we needn't stick to neurons. In other words, we like networks. We like the layering, the deep layering, the hierarchical um, uh, la la layering of, of, the, of the model. But why stick with neurons? In fact, we don't just stick with neurons. Uh, it, we use gates. LSTM uses gates, for example. What are gates? Gates are simple time series models. Uh, examples of exponential smoothing models apply to a hidden state, in fact. So all we're going to do is we're going to generalize the ideas behind GRUs, LSTMs, to layers of gates, or I'm calling those models because really they're just time series models. And, and so it gives us a, a new way of thinking about things. And moreover, we can tailor these models to certain stylized properties of the data that we would expect uh, and can intuit and can interpret. That's the key point. If we don't do that, then we end up with something that's not interpretable. There's no way around that. I mean, just using saliency maps or, or these other methods that are used for interpretability is, uh, you know, explainability is, is really not very helpful in finance. You want to understand what it is that you're modeling and you want to, to, to learn about the, the empirical properties of that data and, and in a way that can be conducive towards investment and portfolio management. And on the time series side, we are going to, again, um, I'm, I'm not going to show you an example here with, the, with a nonlinear constraint, but we're going to see examples here where when the data is, 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 is correlated uh, up to a lag of P, so it's autocorrelation lag of P, then stationary or non-stationary, we are going to use, uh, again, we're going to introduce our own types of gates or models. These, these are parameterized models, these perform model averaging, they extend our existing models, they provide nonlinearity, et cetera, but it's just a generalization of the notion of gates, which everyone uses in deep learning, GRUs, LSTMs, et cetera, but why do we use gates? Why not use a model that we think would be more helpful for the application that we're trying to solve? So it's quite radical in some sense, um, and it's, you know, it's certainly, can seem against the grain of deep learning, but we're going to go and see why you need this. Uh, and this has been born from six years of research of, of just giving up with GRUs and LSTMs and, and all the standard deep learning machinery and finding it uh, not, it, not adequate for the problem. So, so the first one we're going to look at is one that's very important in banking, it's local volatility modeling. Local vol, vol forms the basis for pricing more exotic option prices, which are not traded over the exchange, they're traded over counter. Most of the volume between banks traded is over the counter. You don't have prices for those. And so what we do typically is we fit a local volatility model to exchange traded simple buy, you know, uh, products, vanilla products. And then we take that local volatility model and we build an exotic option pricing model. So it's central to how equity trading desks model and understand and reason about uncertainty in the market uh, and obviously market make with derivatives. So we're going to see an example here where we're going to start with implied volatilities um, to, from derivatives, and we're going to now fit a neural network to implied volatilities, but we're going to embed uh, a gatherall type formula relating the local volatility to the, to the implied volatility. We're still learning from the data, 
there's there's no there's no uh, sort of uh, inconsistency with with the goal of learning from the data, um, and we're going to set this up more formally. I'll spend about uh, a few minutes on this, uh, and then I'll show you another example. There's lots of literature in this area. Uh, it's an, as I said, it's an important uh, topic, and more recently, we're starting to see the emergence of uh, new ideas with replacing gates with uh, implied volatility type models to try and reproduce the empirical properties rather than just take an off the shelf gate. Um, and here's an example of, uh, of an implied volatility surface. Um, and <clears throat> here we've, we're going to split up into training and testing randomly sample. But already you can see, it may be a little bit difficult to see, but the coverage of the data is actually really poor. Um, if I want to look at any maturity log moneyness pair for the derivative, this where I've got data is a very small fraction of where, um, where I potentially need to be able to price uh, the, uh, and, uh, and quote the, the instrument itself. So I'd like to be able to fit a surface to this, but I can't fit any surface to this using a deep learning method because I need to respect certain laws of the financial markets. In particular, a no arbitrage. And so we're going to construct a no, a no arbitrage free uh, interpolation of the surface using deep learning. And, uh, and to do that, um, we're going to construct the following map. A map, this is our map now, this is, I was using F before, now I'm gonna use sigma to make the notation a bit more concrete. This is from my input space, so from my log moneyness, or rather my time and maturity and log moneyness, it's going to give me a map to my implied volatility. And then this is the model, or rather this is the nonlinear partial differential operator acting on uh, my almost my variable of interest. It's not quite on F, it's on uh, a, a, a transformation of F, but now I'm imposing this nonlinear operator, partial differential operator. And I need to do this. If I don't do this, I'll learn garbage. My model will not respect arbitrage, and I will end up with, with results which are, are embarrassingly poor compared to other methods. And so we're going to, so one observation along the way as well is that if I just use the standard Gauss error, it's also not very helpful. And that's because I need to oftentimes weight points which are isolated in my surface. And I can't do that very well if I just use a standard Gauss error. And the reason we're going to see that will become clear in the moment, but what I need to do is modify my Gauss error, and I also need to modify my, uh, my I'm going to impose that nonlinear operator through a, a regularization, a model specific regularization term. And that model, we'll get to what that is in the moment, but what we need to do is introduce a distance matrix into the surface so that points that are isolated don't get missed. If we don't do that, then we end up essentially with a curve that doesn't really uh, acknowledge some of the outliers. We want to acknowledge the outliers. We don't want to just throw them away. Um, they're, they're important pieces of information. Um, and so again, if this was a computer science or, or an engineering talk in Silicon Valley, everything I'm saying would be almost opposite to what you'd be told. Um, and so this is just from uh, our experience of fitting to implied volatility surfaces, where if you do not impose a distance matrix or introduce a distance matrix into the weightings for, for the data, you will end up not being able to, for example, uh, respect uh, certain points. Uh, in other words, the, the line will just miss it because it's convenient from a mean squared error perspective to just simply miss that point. But it is very important in actually fitting to the shape of the surface. And we've been able to run it against industry best standard models that are used in practice by banks and outperform this. And we've only been able to do that by introducing an additional nonlinear operator into, uh, into, into it. So in this case, what we do is we impose a calendar spread constraint, a butterfly spread constraint. These are derivatives on uh, first order and second order convexity derivatives that have to be positive. So there's a requirement for monotonicity and there's a requirement for convexity as well, not just fitting. We have to preserve shapes of, of uh, as well. And if you do that, you don't need as many neurons. You've baked in now a model of the market, and you're still allowing an interpolation to happen. 
Um, and so that's the first, you know, uh, sort of application of the framework where we've really been able to outperform any existing methods um, and extensively backtest them, Monte Carlo backtest, finite difference backtest, on top of the standard mean squared error. What we do is we plug that into a stochastic differential equation, the, the learned model, the neural network model, and see how well it prices in the market with a Monte Carlo backtest, or we use a finite difference crank nicholson scheme with our local volatility learn surface from the deep learner to see how well it does. So we don't just stop at mean squared error. We go much further and deeper into the required sort of metrics for that application. And so the results are fairly extensive. We compare with Gaussian processes, we compare with price-based, we compare with many different variants of different deep learning architectures, which um, hard encode convexity constraints that don't work well. Uh, and that's one example uh, area. Um, so I'll move on to the second topic, switching gears now. Matthew, I'm sorry. I have, I have several questions here. Mm -hmm. um, you say that one of the problems that you had is that the, the data from the market uh, just have a very few points. So if you try to do the machine learning algorithm to learn, one of the problems is that the points are not arbitrary of when you try to fulfill the world surface, the world surface is not arbitrary free. The way that you try to solve this is putting on the penalty function, uh, the condition to be arbitrary free. Yep. But I'm wondering yeah. about other solutions that I think I read. For example, if you try to fit the market data against the model, and you make the machine learning algorithm learn the, the interpolation surface of the stochastic model, the data will be arbitrage free. The okay, algorithm yeah. will learn itself the arbitrage free. Yeah, but but why would you, but that's very, very restrictive. Why would you assume data came from a model? We do not assume data came from a stochastic model. We assume it's arbitrage free, but that's not the same as saying it came from a stochastic model. Uh, yeah, but for example, when you want to value exotic options, you have a specific model to value it. So yeah, but we don't assume that. that you... yeah. We don't assume that. We assume that the market data comes as it is. Right, we're not used. This is not a. This is not what's called a surrogate model. You're talking about a surrogate model. You try to learn an SDE generated data set. We're not doing a surrogate model. We assume the data comes as is, but we want to fit a surface which has no arbitrage. We're not making any assumptions about the data generation process. That's really key, right? That's what makes deep learning interesting. But for example, if you build for each day that you have the data, your local volatility surface, yeah. and then you have a full matrix of surfaces for each day, that each one of them, all of them are arbitrage free because you constructed in that way, and you make the algorithm to learn without imposing the condition, the algorithm will learn the condition by itself? No, it won't. Because I can It won't. I mean, I, all our results, if you just, if you don't, Pose that condition, it it, it fails visibly, and it's so it just it's very oscillatory. That's been our experience, and I can send you the paper. And uh, this is published in the Siam Journal of Financial Mathematics. I can send you the paper. I can send you all the code. You can run it, um, convince yourself, but yeah. it, it doesn't it doesn't learn that constraint. I was asking because there is a different approach from a paper of who. Uh, Maxime Bergeron, I think that is the other name. And mm -hmm. um, what they do is they do variational and autoencoders. And as all the data that they fit into the variational autoencoder, they are saying that that the, the algorithm will learn by itself the, the not arbitrary. Mm. But why? Why would that work? Well, uh, they say that by construction, but they don't give. Many yeah, days I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at the paper, but I, I'm not convinced that that would work. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. But yeah, it, but if, it, if there's a math, if the math is there, then I'll, I'll definitely look at it. But if it's just that without the math, then I, I don't believe it. Um, that's just my opinion. <laughs> it's just how, why, why would that work? I mean, I, I, I think all I'm trying to do here is explain, hopefully, something that is at least convincing with respect of why it would work. Um, you know, or we're, we're not doing anything interesting here other than 
building in a local volatility model so that we can essentially enforce those constraints. Um, but we're not restricting the data itself to be from a stochastic process. Um, and so we can handle you know, noise in the data, for example. We can handle the fact that there are bid-R spreads. Right? We, we fit to bid-R spreads. We don't fit to just a stochastic process generated data. So, um, so yeah, I, if you send me the link, I'll take a look at the paper, but I'm, you know, I don't see how you can just magically learn a constraint. Um, that just seems, um, yeah, that just, it seems, seems strange to me, but, but thanks for your comment though. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I don't really have much time here. Uh, to, to, I wanted to switch gears to time series method. So uh, another way that we can apply model frameworks is as I said before, to get rid of things that you know we all think are gospel, but actually we don't really need. Um, and so uh, I actually don't believe that you need LSTMs. Um, I just I, I think that um, you can you can easily replace them with things that are simpler and get comparable results. And in fact, we have a paper that that does that. Um, and you only have to look inside the LSTM to see what's going on and realize that uh, you know there are. It, it's really not as complicated as it needs to be. Um, and so if we start from an RNN cell, it's just a simple, typically it's, it's a 10H, it has to be a 10H to be, to, be a, to be a stable architecture for RNN, can't be a sigmoid, it's proof for that. Um, and go one step further with GRU cell, you now introduce a dynamic smoothing type parameter into the problem. You now have this smoothing parameter alpha, which dynamically smooths, and then the LSTM adds one more it adds a, a, a gate. Now, I don't have very much time here, um, but, but I'm gonna say that when you look at the universe of models in time series for finance and reconcile that with machine learning techniques, there's a lot of similarities. And you can show that RNNs are just a, a nonlinear extension of ARIMA models, autoregressive models. Um, you can add in moving average type terms and, and extend to ARIMA. You can uh, generalize Garch type models, which are used for, uh, for modeling uh, uncertainty, uh, volatility rather. And in fact, uh, what we're going to see is you can simply just very easily take, ver make, you know, just smooth out. You can, if you have stationary data, you can fix that smoothing parameter, no need for it to be dynamic. And you can come up with a simpler architecture that's suitable for stationary data. We'll call this an alpha RNN or you can dynamically smooth, um, and we'll call it an alpha RNN, um, or you can even introduce uh, a noise into the model here and simulate noise and model the standard deviation of that noise as a time-dependent variable. So we're gonna make the noise now what's called heteroscedastic as opposed to homoscedastic. All the machine learning methods you see assume the error is homoscedastic, but that's very limited in finance. Heteroscedastic means that the error can change any time. And, and so you can model things like volatility dynamically. Um, and so we're going to build a Garch cell just by taking a standard off the shelf econometric model and applying that now to our, it, to our hidden state. So I don't have very much time. I'm going to skip all the, the background here um, on how this all works. This is our Garch model. You may have seen this before. You have a volatility term here on the left. You have some shocks or noise terms squared, and then you have this recurrence relation between past uh, standard deviations. I know I've got very little time left. And then what we do is we then are going to build that into an RNN. Um, and we can derive uh, essentially how to do that. Um, I'm, 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 I've sort of done some derivations here. There isn't time to go into this in detail, um, but ultimately we come up with uh, a probabilistic type Garch cell where now we simulate the noise from the model under a certain past state of the standard deviation that goes as input. This is our model now, our mathematical model as, as a gate. And now we simulate um, our, our uncertainty well as a dynamic model, uh, as a dynamic variable. And all this is happening, all that's happening is we're treating the hidden state um, internally um, as, as, uh, as in terms of this model here. So it's adding in this extra sort of noise term. Um, and this gives us now results that we can run on uh, stock, stocked prices. So we've got daily 
I, uh, IBM forecast is hit here and we can use our window um, of uncertainty like we can with the Bayesian type model. Um, and we can, can essentially uh, you know, run all these different variants in a Bayesian setting and look at the amount of uncertainty in the prediction as well as the, the price um, and run it alongside GRUs, LSTMs, look at the parameters, look at the MRS, RS, RMSEs, MREs. Um, and a goal here, as I said before, wrapping up, because I only have a minute or two left, um, is to not only reduce the amount of training time because you need fewer parameters. So here's a model, for example, where um, just by, by tailoring the gate and realizing the data was stationary, I could use a fixed parameter and I could simplify my architecture. I needed far fewer parameters. And as a result, I get better training, I get faster training times. Um, and my performance is, is very comparable as is my confidence intervals for the prediction. They are, uh, they are they should be a 95% confidence interval. And so those numbers are slightly underestimating the confidence. Um, oh, sorry, 90% uh, confidence interval. Um, and we can also look at five day ahead or one day ahead um, and try to understand the deterioration of the model as we predict further. But again, all of this based on this general framework that we're introducing. We're not taking an off the shelf deep learning method and just hoping that all the usual machinery works. We're trying to approach this like a financial practitioner or a quant or a uh, financial econometrics, uh, someone who does financial econometrics and or a statistician uh, and arrive at results that uh, you know, make, make sense. So we have lots of results here on forecasting errors, HFT data, Bitcoin data. It's all in these papers. All the code is in these papers. Um, there is not enough time for me to say too much, but I'll end here by saying that I think perceptrons are blunt instruments for, for financial modeling. It's really just the worst case scenario is you have to use perceptrons. It's fine, but that's going to be a very resource intensive exercise. Why not try to replace the perception with a more meaningful building block? This is inductive bias, but this is already what LSTMs do. They provide a time series type model internally or a GIU. And so we're just extending that idea naturally to a broader set of models that we can use that we like in finance. And we're, bu and we're building better models than we did previously because we're now allowing nonlinearity, we're allowing model averaging, and we're using the network to arrive at some sort of model average of those primitive econometric building blocks. Um, and we're seeing examples here where we can uh, you know, we easily incorporate this into Bayesian frameworks of so PyTorch as PyTorch implementations um, and as TensorFlow's implementations of, of these examples I've just shown you. Uh, and as I said, these are all in the papers. Um, and also some of the material here is described in our book. All right, so I'll stop there. That's a complete information overload, <laughs> but hopefully uh, some food for thought um, about the need for frameworks and deep learning that embody financial sort of best practices and knowledge. Okay. Well, brilliant, Matthew. Um, any questions from the audience, right? Any questions? Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yeah, hello. Uh, hello, Dr. Alonzo and Mr. Dixon. These talks were very, very thought-provoking, even though it's just too, in, too much information to process in this time. Uh, I wanted to ask, since these uh, presentations are so detailed and so extensive, are these talks maybe that you've given before? And maybe we can look up that recording on YouTube to have a more complete context without having to go through all of the reference papers? Um, I have not given this talk before um, that's recorded. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the first part of the talk I've, um, I've, I've given, but also I think that was a 20 minute talk. Um, so no, I haven't, I don't have it. Sorry, this is fairly fresh material. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, I think, um, yeah, we will see, obviously the recording will be available. We'll see how we can right, uh, make the presentations available. In any case, right, um, I, you know, uh, 
I think it's it's always better to read the papers, right? It's it's well, I, it's not always better. I think it's it's if you want a deep dive, which is what you want to want to do, right? Uh, I really encourage you to go through uh, the papers we we're, we're we're sharing here, right? In where you see you know, all the motivations and you, in which you see how the experiments were conducted, right? And and. And yeah, but we we will we'll we'll, we'll we'll try to right uh, see how we can um, make these presentations available. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would I would add to that and just say I think it's important to take away something conceptually, not necessarily all the details. You know, you can always which I'm, I'm trying to give you a you know a roadmap to some further information, but I think it's important to take stock of the main conceptual ideas because those are the most important. And the main conceptual ideas just to recount here that if you just take an off-the-shelf deep learning method or, or a tool and apply all the usual you know machinery that you would use from you know any textbook on deep learning you're going to run into several problems um, and I think I think it, it you either on board with that or you're not and if you're not on board with that then it doesn't make sense to go into all these details um, so I think it you know it, it's a question for you know for you to sort of try and, and share your own battle scars with, with your experiences on financial data sets. Can I? Ask yeah, definitely. It, uh, sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. I, having come from, you know, trying to, to use these deep learning techniques in, in financial markets, I, I couldn't agree, um, you know, more wholeheartedly with, with, with your characterization that you just can't, throw everything in and, and I tried to build a, 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 a model using deep learning uh, that uh, predicts, uh, you know, basically makes markets in high yield, high yield corporate bonds. And, hmm. you know, and, and I inherited a model, uh, a deep learning model that was, you know, mathematically sophisticated, as you suggest, but domain knowledge ignorant and, you know, it just doesn't work, right? So you have to embed what, what I think, you know, the, the main, I mean, that's, that's your main point really is that yeah. you can't throw anything in these models, but I, I actually give it, have, 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 a, have a deeper question that came about when you were talking about embedding, say, you know, stochastic, you know, sort of volatility um, that's, that's stochastic in nature in a time series model in an LSTM framework. Mm -hmm. Um what you were really suggesting there, and I love that because, you know, I, that's the kind of volatility you see in the financial markets, um, you know, and, and, but then in the end, you came out and said, well, why are we using, you know, why are we trying to do that any, anymore? Why don't we just go with those models themselves in a, in a simpler fashion than the deep learning framework? Mm -hmm. um, Am I missing the point there, or am I? No, you're, you're right. So, you, you know, if you follow the logic, it almost seems circular, right? Because, you know, I'd start by saying, well, we need deep, you know, we love deep learning. It's a great tool. We're not going to give it up. And then I spent the rest of the talk sort of <laughs> yeah. bashing deep learning um, and, and sort of, you know, saying how great these models were before deep learning. And at the end, I, I, it's not clear really what I'm saying. So yeah. let me just clarify. If you just take these econometrics models that you know you're talking about, that you know people love and, and they you know, seem to work reasonably well, the problem there is you've got an inherent model risk. Like which one do you take? You know, there's all these different variants, right? With different stochastic parameterizations and so on. And the idea, if if you use models as building blocks, then you can parameterize them all slightly differently, and you can also it, it make them non-linear in a deep learning framework. So in the end, it's not your what you're doing is essentially trying to get the performance power of deep learning, predictive performance, but also trying to build it from simpler economically interpretable building building blocks, like you know, these GARCH type models. So yeah. if you just use GARCH, the predictive performance is terrible. I mean, it doesn't have all the built-in machinery, doesn't use stochastic gradient descent. It doesn't have all the machinery of deep learning to make it work. It doesn't have a rich enough parameterization. So what you're trying to do is combine some of the things that we like about those models, but still rely on the power of deep learning to essentially, you know, networks, hierarchical layers, activation functions to make things nonlinear. And you're trying to essentially build up, 
a sort of a, a something that is, you know, the sum is more than, you know, there's the saying, the, you know, the whole is more than some of the parts. You know, that's what we're trying to do here with deep learning is fit, fit it all together and still get excellent, you know, performance. Uh, maybe not as always as good as out off the shelf, but at least then you've got some economic interpretive ability. Well, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. But, you know, what, what I'm trying to grasp here is, is it almost the relationship between what you're saying and what I see in image transmission, right? Where, you know, where, where you, you take models, for example, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll relate this back to finance in a second, but where you take models that have been developed, you know, based on, on the brain in order to process image things, but yet, but then after you've understood those, right, you encode those in hardware which, which is analogous to say the you know Garch model or whatever is our economic hardware, and that hardware um, basically you know becomes in 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 the economic sense right the, the Garch model becomes like an input to the network, but it saves mm -hmm. the network from having to build the Garch model within itself. Yet it allows the network to tune the parameters of the Garch model to the problem under study. Because that's yeah. the, the analogy in the image processing, right? Is once we've we've understood, you know, this from a computational yep. point of view, right? We in hardware, right? But we we allow still the network to tune the hardware, given the sort of um, knobs we have, if you will, to turn on the parameters of that hardware. Yeah, I so I agree with you. I agree, and I think a lot of people are already doing this. You know. Um, when you mentioned you're using Garch or something deep learning, you know, I've heard several quants or hedge funds say, yeah, we do something like that already. You know, we, we took some, um, you know, we took some Garch model. We generated some features. We used the Garch, <laughs> yeah. We use the Garch model for feature engineering. And then, you know, we fed that in to a deep learner and then we'd use the standard architecture. There's right? a lot that, of talk on wall street though. So, you know, don't always, uh, I've been there. I've lived there. <laughs> yeah. I would also like to add yeah. something, which is that uh, our experience with uh, using uh, uh, well uh, deep learning, right? Broadly speaking, in time series, it, if you look at our papers, you'll find that our MSCs, MSCs are extremely close, right? Dif using different models, right? So um, there's also so so it's even hard to choose right so, sometimes right okay. uh, right if you so that's one thing right that for example we try n bits we didn't find any any significant um, any significant advantage compared to other rnn structures but this is again our test in uh, uh, in a in a in a financial time series data set so that's one thing the other thing i would like to say is that it's a very interesting question Obviously, as to uh, as to whether do you how can you bake knowledge into your modeling? Do you bake knowledge in the algorithms, adding mm -hmm. constraints, which is obviously something you like because then you can control the output and so on. And the other is to what extent is also analogous to you know actually actually using a data set that already has these properties, right? Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, th this is obviously, uh, I, I really obviously do prefer having algorithms that are more parametric rather than, uh, you know, but, but, but it's, uh, as you mentioned, Matthew, there's, there's a lot of discussions as to how we ca you can enrich, right, um, the historical data sets that are so poor. So right. historical data sets are very poor, right? Yeah. So one way is you can generate more, 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 more data. And this is, you know, good and bad at the same time, right? Because, and uh, one other way is making knowledge, these principles that Matthew mentioned in the algorithms. So principles that we think that they have to be met, right? Like uh, non-arbitrage principles and so on. So I think this is a very interesting, we'll see in the future, we can, we can see a convergence of, uh, right? Uh, but I think to some point there's an, there's an analogy as to if you, if you bake this in the, in the data versus, right? If you bake knowledge into the algorithm, right? Um, um, but, but anyway, so thank you very much. And any other question? Can I just add one more point? And I don't mean to, to, to you know, prolong this presentation, but, you know, 
I, from as a practical matter, right? As a practitioner, right? I'm both a modeler and a, and a, and a trader, for example, and I'm looking at this or, and, or, or a standard economy, economy, economist. Um, I, I want to look at the problem from both perspectives, right? From both the classical model perspective and by embedding the classical model in the network to see what the network offers as a different answer from the classical yeah. method. And that will help me understand the process better. Right. I mean, I, why would I throw yeah. away information from any source, right? I mean, right. you're exactly right. And that's actually what motivated this. When I work with some um, asset management funds, the number one question they would have is, what does deep learning do for me? And I want an apples to apples explanation of why this is better. Um, and the great thing about deep learning is that you can turn off the activation functions and you can just use a neuron and you've got the old model, you've got the basic model, right? The deep learning, when you switch on the activation, it becomes nonlinear. If you turn it off, it becomes linear. Yeah. So it, in a way, you've got that switch to, you know, for backward compatibility, if you will. So you can run your existing model or you can flick the switch. And then what you've done is you've controlled your software environment. You've controlled your, your algorithms, they're still the same. And therefore you can say for sure but it's not, not because of a different software implementation or a different implementation of stochastic gradient descent or whatever it is, you can isolate the, the value add of deep learning purely yeah. to the architecture. And that's, I think, really interesting because yeah. if I just run my model, maybe I had a MATLAB implementation of econ you know, some econometrics model R in a different package, I ran my deep learning tool. Even if I set those up mathematically to be identical, I'll get different results different random number generators, all sorts of different reasons why those would not be the same. So it actually gives you a controlled setting to be able to see what the incremental value of deep learning is. Agreed, no, that's excellent, thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, okay, so thank you very much. If you wanna, you know, uh, uh, so pay attention, we will do more, more of these right, in the future. And also, again, uh, we really uh, welcome you, to, uh, encourage you to take our, our bootcamp, right, uh, uh, from the 23rd September to the 3rd September, right, you're, you're interested. And in any, in any case, thank you very much for your ac active participation in the webinar. It's been uh, really very interesting. And we had very nice discussions. Thank you very much, everybody.